Okay, thanks uh, for the introduction. I have to make a disclaimer before I begin. Uh, at the time when I came up with this title, I was kind of influenced by uh, reading about new media and, and new, new websites dispersing news. So uh, I was inspired, if you can use that word correctly, to come up with a clickbait uh, title of my own. And this is the one I came up with. Um, I decided maybe I should uh, delete the three part and just keep the amazingly easy. But uh, I don't think we're quite at amazingly easy either. So um, during my talk, um, I will um, try and give you some taste on some of the taxonomic tools that you can use in GenBank. Um, and hopefully some of you will be inspired to find more information uh, uh, if you know more of the uh, options that are available. So this is the kind of list listicles that you find on a website such as BuzzFeed. And the one on the left there is the most useful one I could find. It does something about biology and I uh, thought it was kind of funny. And then uh, I decided to come up with a useful one using uh, information in GenBank. So um, just as a way to find ways that one can start to clean up things. I mean, there's so many erroneously identified things. One needs to uh, find the most useful ones first. So what would be the 10 most important genera um, to clean up in GenBank first? So here's one way to attack the problem, and, and I have to thank Barbara Roberts uh, who did the query. I don't think you'll be able to, to read this slide very well, but basically she um, compiled all the, all the uh, mentions of specific species in PubMed Central, which is um, the PubMed repository for complete texts. And once again, it's biased towards medical literature. And she also looked at specific species accessions um, that's associated with these articles. So if you use that, that's a very rough guide. Uh, of course, the top species, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, no surprise there, uh, followed by Pombe, uh, Aspergillus, and down the list. So if we pass it into genera, this is the list that I came up with. So, um, uh, you know, that list could, could change. I, I'm very hopeful about Canada after uh, the yeast symposium or the yeast workshop. I think we can improve Canada a lot. Um, but of course, there will be all these orphan Canadas that doesn't have a place. Um, Second, uh, Fusarium is, is a very tricky one. Uh, there's an amazingly high number of ITS sequences for Fusarium, even though it's not a commonly used marker in Fusarium phylogenetics. Um, in GenBank, and a lot of them are poorly identified or wrongly identified. There's very little type material uh, for Fusarium. So the, the, the point would be to work with experts in the field and come up with ways that we can verify information, um, add epitypes and so forth to make it uh, more easily accessible for the common user. Cryptococcus and down the list, uh, Trichoderma is one that I can probably start first with. Um, the, the taxonomy is relatively um, well sorted out. Um, there's a number of combinations that need to be made and I've already started moving over most of the hypocrea names I think there's about 15 left in GenBank that needs to be moved into Trichoderma and I will do my best to come up with a list and contact uh, the Trichoderma experts in the field and have them give me some feedback. So, uh, of course, the other point of my um, title was thinking about the, the glut of information that we live in these days. and. Um, we have to deal, the, the real challenge now is not to get more information, it's about filtering out the irrelevant stuff. So you're shoveling this huge amount of information around, and this is something we see daily at GenBank, of course. Um, and if we look back in time, it was kind of the same process. Our tools was just a little bit smaller and less efficient. And if we look forward, it's gonna continue. So we need to think of ways now that we can see um, the things that might be coming down the, the bend, things uh, of, of ways we can improve um, genomes, for instance, I'll say something about that later. 
um, as they come into GenBank, we can learn from uh, uh, the bacterial genomes, for instance, and come up with some standards that would make a life easier for mycologists in the future. So let's start with the present. Uh, and before I continue, I just want to highlight, I'm going to talk about three main databases in GenBank. There's several databases. Um, nuclear, the nucleotide, oops, the nucleotide database, uh, which is commonly referred to as GenBank, and then there's RefSec, which is a curated database. Uh, taking um, accessions from GenBank, there's various parts of RefSec, but I will talk about the targeted loci part of RefSec that focus on specific barcode loci. And um, then the taxonomy database is a separate database that informs the other two. So I'm actually the curator for the fungal uh, information at the taxonomy database. And then the taxonomy database are used to, to populate certain fields in some of the other databases. So this is the present. So this is a, a typical query. This is a query I actually got last week from Ulrike Dam, who I believe is not, not present here, but she was looking at uh, collected trichum uh, species. She notices that 34 of, she expected about nine sequences that she sequenced, and for some reason there's 34 of them in GenBank. There's a problem here. So part of the problem is the, and I should highlight this, and this is something that, that's been actively worked on, um, the definition lines and the taxonomy, when you go down in your accession, you look at the organism source feature, the definition lines are not uh, automatically updated. So uh, at some point last year, I merged Colletotrichum lentis with Glomerella truncata. So they're now synonyms in the database. So the old stuff that came in is Glomerella truncata. The definition line still reflects that. So there is a process underway to have all these things being updated automatically, but it's turning out to be more challenging than was thought, but it's, it's, you know, for us taxonomists, it's a high priority. So that's one thing. And I'll talk a little bit about how you can get the accurate taxonomic names out of GenBank. There's a way to do that as well. But anyway, here's our 34 accessions. Let's have a look. So this is MobBlast. I've talked several times before about this tool. It's a new BLAST interface. Um, some of you might not be aware of it. But there's a URL. If you want more details about it, let me know. It's very useful to do quick and dirty um, verifications in GenBank. It allows you to do multiple searches. Um, at this point, 300 sequences at a time, up to 5,000 by space and length. It's not always very fast, but if you put it in, you go and make yourself some coffee and come back, you might see something happening. So um, just taking the 34 accessions, uh, from our problematic data set, we can see the relationship amongst other accessions in the data, in the database. So here is one, uh, so MobBlast uh, automatically split these things up by gene. I think this is actin, actin. You can see in yellow the query sequences. In green um, is the type, uh, types of specific species that's highlighted in GenBank. And this seems fairly okay. There's nothing really to say these things are wrong or right. Um, so it's always fine here. Now we get to ITS. So now, now the, the problem is, is getting um, uh, more serious. So here we have a whole slew, oops, a whole slew of sequences uh, dispersed through um, a poorly defined group. Um, they're clearly not Colletotrichum lentis. If we look closer, there is the Colletotrichum lentis sequences and a Colletotrichum lentis type. So those um, look like they should be Colletotrichum lentis. Um, so how do we fix this? <laughs> and at this point, I really don't have an easy answer. So the obvious thing and the current thing is still to contact the owners of those sequences and let them know we want to change the names, and can we change the names? If it's a really egregiously wrong thing, such as a fun fungal sequence that's been sequenced as an epiphyte in a plant, those things can be unverified and they will be removed from BLAST. But when it's something closely related to that, it is a much harder problem to address. So this gets into taxonomy. I'm a trichum expert. 
Ulrike is, um, so I can ask her, but then I still have to get permission. So those things, so for a small problem like this, I could do it. I think if I look harder, and this is just limited to the top five hits, I will find a hundred more sequences, thousands probably more, that, that will need to get this treatment. So it's really not an efficient way to update the database. Um, these at the bottom here, I don't see a way to fix them at this point. Um, the best solution still is, in my mind, is to make the type material as clearly de demarcated as possible. So if you do a query, you can clearly see these things are sitting away from a type. So making that as complete as possible. That uh, is the most efficient way I can spend my time. I only have so much time on, on which to um, try and work on problems, and I think the type material problem is uh, the easiest. So let's talk about that. So this is the, the starting page for the targeted loci project. I'm not sure how well people in the back can see, but I just put up the whole page because I want to indicate that there's several targeted loci currently in this project. They're all ribosomal markers. Um, they both for the bacteria and the archaea. They include 16S, of course, but also um, 23 SO bacteria and then uh, the three archaea bacterial genes. And then for fungi at the bottom here, we've got a large, small, and ITS. So large and small subunit is only 100 or so sequences. We actually have a set of 500 or more LSU sequences we can upload into RevSec, and that's something we will do in the near future. But then we have ITS, and I think there's almost 3,000 sequences. Yes. So if you do a query in the nucleotide database using the bio project number, and that's uh, 177353, but you can go to the bio project page and click through from there. Um, currently, it's about 2,881 sequences. It gets added a very, at a very low rate. We do it. Um, on occasion, when we notice things which are phylogenetically distinct, um, it takes a lot of time. We need to go manually check these sequences, see if we can link it to herbaria or fungaria or uh, culture collections. Um, so it's, 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 it's a very useful thing. I hope it's a useful thing. You have to tell me if, if it's a useful way that I should spend my time. If, if it's not useful to people, I can find other useful things to do. Um, but it's, it's not a very efficient way to... Um, to go about things. Uh, we will continue to add these things, of course, and we're working with uh, specific groups. I'll say more about that as well. So the other part of this is not looking at the sequences, but looking at the taxonomy database. <coughs> so this is something I do daily. If I, if I update new species names, um, I, I verify that the species name is correct as much as I can using the nomenclature databases. Uh, or sometimes publications, if it's available already. Uh, and then I add, if there's type information, I add the type information directly into the taxonomy database. Um, so there's a couple of issues with this. Um, here's an example of a name I just added last week, uh, Abruthalus bumii, that's just been published. The, holot the holotype is indicated here, um, but it's, a, it's basically the collector number, as is common for uh, Herbarium collectors, there's no herbarium number given. Um, this is a common thing. Um, and then um, I have to basically figure out what is the correct format from the publication, making sure that the number in the publication agrees with the number that's been given in the GenMac accession. Otherwise, those two will never be linked. So I, I basically end up adding several several formats of the same thing. So it's not like we have several holotypes. It's basically the format, and I will add a, um, if there's a herbarium number, I can add that as the holotype as well. So not very efficient. Um, part of this, I think, is um, something that we should work with the journals as well to ensure that um, the biological information is there in a very structured way so that the databases can access it more easily. And this is not a very efficient way uh, for me to spend my time. But this is the, the current state of affairs. Uh, and of course, uh, taxonomic descriptions is some of the most structured things you can find in a paper. So an XML uh, format that you can 
you can verify and that reviewers can verify the type information would be very useful. So this is what it looks like, just what it looks like in the taxonomy browser. What I showed you previously is my small little interface that I use. So you see multiple um, variations of type material there. Of course, um, the Darwin Core triplet, and there's multiple ways that one can um, track um, type specimen information, X-type culture information. Uh, the Darwin Core triplet is currently used at GenBank, where it's for things like CBS. CBS comes in with the correct format anyway, but in, in well-known cases, the indexes will correct it in the records. But for the, a lot of the herbarium uh, cases, it, it's, 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 um, it's, it's much more tricky. So, so this is what the specimen voucher looks like in the, in the space, uh, the, the details look like in the actual accession in GenBank. So what I had to do was copy that whole text in, otherwise the database wouldn't recognize it. According to Darwin Core, which is uh, institution code with a colon, an optional co collection code, with a colon and then your specimen ID. Um, the best way to fix this would be to use the MA herbarium and then the collector number. It's still not ideal that we have to deal with the collector number because some herbarium databases abbreviate the collectors, so there's all sorts of issues there. But this would still be much better than using it in this, in this format. So, important part of this is to communicate to the users that uh, Darwin Core triplets is the way to go. That's uh, also a part of the challenge here. So let's go back to our collector trichum um, example. So um, I already showed you the RefSec ITS database. So if we go and look at how many uh, collector trichum ITS sequences there are in GenBank, um, if you do a query with collector trichum and the bioproject number, uh, 83 is currently listed in the RefSec database, so that's been verified and annotated. Uh, if we want to expand RefSec, there's another 69, there's a total of 152 just from cross-linking the uh, information in the taxonomy database uh, with that in the nucleotide database. I could uh, validate another 69 sequences and put that into the RefSec database. So that would be uh, a high priority to do. Uh, and then the other, the other um, important thing I think now is to work with specific groups uh, and have them uh, validate specific sets of ITS sequences. So in this case, it's, it's a more functional uh, driven uh, approach. So this is a recent collaboration that we had with Isham the International Society for Human and Animal Mycology. This is a paper that's just been published in Medical Mycology. Lots of authors. They um, basically built a database of ITS sequences for most medical species. Uh, Vincent Robert and others were involved in setting up the database. It's cross-linked uh, to, to um, data and other databases such as UNITE. We added several links in GenBank, uh, link outs to this database, and there's also DB cross refs within the GenBank accessions. So uh, it's easily uh, linked between the different um, databases, which is what we want. Um, and then because there's a link out attached to these sequences, you can uh, do a link out provider search. So L-O-P-R-O-V stands for uh, link out provider. If you use the search term Isham ITS, you will get 2,696 ITS sequences that's been linked out to the ITS database. Uh, at the same time that we do these link outs because they have multiple ITS sequences, um, we want to have an ITS sequence, if it's not from type, then preferably from a verified um, isolate to represent each potential species. So let's... Um, okay, so I'm going to go a little bit on a side route here just to show you some of the search options that you have. I'm going to take this um, Isham ITS database. If you want to see how many species are represented, 
in this uh, query that you just did in, nucle in the nucleotide database, you can click on the find related links on the right hand side, go down to taxonomy, uh, and then you, you'll find a list of the species names in that set. Uh, there's a problem here because uh, this says you can only cross link up to a thousand links. So anything below a thousand links works well. You can do this type of cross linking between various databases. You can go into the genome assembly database, for instance, and do the same query there. Um, but uh, so, so I'm going to show you one, one way to deal with something that's more than a thousand possible um, uh, accessions. And uh, this, this is, is the entree direct um, option. You can do it on Unix co command line. Some of you might be comfortable doing that. Um, there's a manual to use it, and it's a really powerful way to interact with, with uh, GenBank. I just want to show you that these options are out there if you go to the, to the NIH books um, um, uh, um, page. The manual will be there. It will show you how to install it and what search terms you can use on a command-driven interface. So, for example, for this query now, I just ran this uh, query and entry, entry direct. Um, it basically starts with the same uh, search query um, I did in the nucleotide database, then it passes it, queries it against the taxonomy database, and then passes out the scientific names, and then you come up with a list of 409 species in that data set. So that's just an example of the different ways that you can actually use GenBank besides just going through the BLAST interface. There's another example I want to show you that I find quite useful is to use some of the tools in the taxonomy database. So I just showed you a list of names. Uh, and I just mentioned at the beginning of the talk that um, the most accurate information, the most accurate inf uh, taxonomic information isn't always in the deaf line. Uh, so you want to verify a, a list of species and see which of them are present in GenBank and which are not present. Uh, there's some tools at the taxonomy database. I'm going to highlight one. Uh, if you click on name ID status on the taxonomy homepage, you will come to this, um, this interface. This allows you to directly paste a list of names into the web interface. Um, you can get a lineage for each of those names. It will tell you if those names are present in GenBank or not, and what the current name is in GenBank, if it's, if it's a synonym of a name. That's, uh, that's not current, the current name in GenBank. So taking that list, so actually the, the list of names I chose was, I was working with Andy Miller, so he was trying to see how many of his species were in GenBank, and this is an output I got. I didn't check the, the lineage link, but you can also get a lineage for each of these. Uh, a number of these have got the code three, which means they're not present in GenBank, but when they are present, it gives you a code here, gives you a tax ID for that name, and then it gives you the most current name in GenBank. Of course, the GenBank classification isn't always the, the most correct classification. Um, often, the most recent things are the most, uh, most accurate things in GenBank because it came from a recently sequenced phylogeny. So in, 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 a, in a few cases, in more than a few cases, uh, the GenBank data might actually be more accurate than the taxonomy data at uh, species from Gorum, for instance. For instance. So, um, in response to the list of Andy, I actually made a couple of updates in our GenBank classification, and I would hope we can do that for some of the other lists that's being generated as part of this symposium, um, so that I can make changes where they are needed and provide useful information in, in other cases. But anyway, if you guys are coming up with these lists, this might be a good way to, to see what the current names in GenBank are. Um, so before I go into the future, I just want to say that the medical, I forgot to say that when I was talking about the medical sequences, um, there's also a plant ethology list of names. That's, that's, uh, there's a working group that's going to work on that. 
And it would be really good if we can do something similar. It will be much more challenging for the plant pathogens, but come up with a list of sequences and, and, and references for the plant pathogens that one could link to maybe a database somewhere. It's, the medical thing was a nicely well-defined little set. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the, the direction we should be going in. We can look at uh, food-related food uh, strains and highlight them, industrial strains and so forth. So let's look a little bit towards the future um, and try and see what's coming around the bend. Um, so I already talked about the RefSec um, database. Um, currently, it's only for ribosomal genes, um, but there's a limitation in that. Um, and this is, and I'm getting very speculative now, but we, we really need to think about protein coding markers. Um, many of the genome data that's coming in is not associated with ribosomal data. So it's very hard to make the link between your ITS accessions and genomes. Um, protein coding markers will be much more effective at that. So I will need to convince the powers that be that, that we need protein coding marker RefSec and I need to figure out which marker to use. We need to figure out if we even have to do annotation on these protein coding markers. But let's look at a couple of candidates. I was looking at RBB2. That's, that seems to be broadly used by many groups. There currently is more than a thousand species um, um, tied to 1,200 sequences from type material in GenBank. So those would be the first candidates. Of course, the type material in GenBank is not complete, so that, that will, we need to keep on expanding that. So this is just a, a, a smaller set of maybe much more uh, X-type sequences in GenBank. Uh, and this is just a comparison of other potential protein markers. In this case, we just queried uh, the set of um, sequ sequences, uh, names attached to the sequences, and broke them down by class. So I'm not going to talk about the specific classes, um, but uh, as you can see, elongation factor is, a, is another potential a gene that's actually two th more than 2,000 sequences, um, but we might have another um, under the bus problem that uh, Amy was talking about, where you had different groups um, sequencing different parts of the same gene, and it's not alignable. I think it's it's especially problematic in elongation factor. There might be a similar problem in RBB2, I'm not sure. But that's something that one will have to look into. I think um, compared to something like actin, which has got about the same amount of sequences, uh, RBB2 looks much more diverse. Uh, blue is erosiomycetes, for instance. Yellow is saccharomycetes. Uh, green is sodariomycetes. So the main classes are well balanced very similar to elongation factor, but if you look at something like actin, it's, it's obviously more focused in specific groups. So if you want to look at a protein coding marker, you want something that's broadly dispersed over all the classes. So that's just an idea. Um, it's something that one should think about uh, in future, and it, it will have to be well thought out because it might take some time to annotate some of these, re-annotate some of these RBB2 sequences. So this is, I'm going to skip this slide. This is. Uh, a number of other genes that I compared. But let's look at genomes now. So I talked about using the protein coding markers to make the link to genomes. So if we can look at um, sequences tied to type material again, at the bottom of the bar uh, of the screen is a not up to scale bar representing the more than 30,000 binomial fungal species that's currently in GenBank. Uh, of which we have almost 6,000 uh, species uh, annotated, well, tied to type material. And that, that covers all, all genes. It's not necessarily ITS. Some of those will have, a majority of them will have ITS, as you can see here. Um, for, 2000, for those, 2,700 um, species uh, have ITS. Uh, actually, ITS in the RefSec database. So there might be some ITS that's not yet in RefSec. So it might actually be a larger group. But this is what we currently have in ITS. If we look at genomes, um, 500 genomes in GenBank, already we have 72 genomes from type, which, which I find is you know, a surprisingly high number. 
I believe most of them are yeasts, but uh, potentially you wouldn't want a lot more genomes from type coming in. Uh, moving on. Uh, I want to just quickly um, talk about the bacterial genomes. Um, this is, um, of course, there's 15, roughly 50,000 15, species of bacteria. 25% um, uh, have type genomes in GenBank. You can do several methods uh, like this alignment free Kamer trees uh, to compare those genomes. And I'm going to show you one. Uh, example, this is a bacterial Kamer tree. Um, the things in red are misidentified species. You can uh, actually type species. You can clearly um, delineate which things are misidentified. And um, next month, there will be a meeting of bacteriologists at GenBank to talk about ways that the type material from genomes can be used to improve bacterial taxonomy. And a lot of this can be done automatically. So we did a quick um, uh, run through of uh, fungal genomes just to see if we can use this pipeline that's been generated for bacteria for fungi. Um, of course, fungi are much more sparsely, sparsely sampled. So the important part is that you have multiple genomes closely related. That's uh, densely sampled genomes. This becomes really useful. Um, so in this case, there's already one example of a misidentified genome that came in, a mucor that it's sitting amongst uh, the Rhizobus arises. We can look for things like contamination. This is a case where uh, half of the genome told one story and another half told another story. Um, so that's the kind of things, the kind of quality control you have to do. So I'll finish by just mentioning that we're spending a lot of time thinking about uh, mining um, the journals for taxonomic information. But there's also other sources of information that's very useful. And this is a very um, nice website. I saw a talk by the, um, the guy who started this, Jason Cole. He's, um, he's a wildlife biologist, I believe. Um, and he, he basically started mining, started geotagging um, papers um, according to where things were sampled. So he's doing this semi-automatically. I think there's some manual annotation. But we ideally want to take the information that's in the journals and try and link it to sequences as well. Of course, people put it into the database, but we really want to, 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 to get additional information. And this is um, the same slide that John showed yesterday. This is the kind of thing you can do. Um, this is the paper was actually just published. And this is sort of making heat maps of uh, house dust samples across the United States and finding that it correlates with uh, specific species occurring in specific areas. They actually want to use this for forensic uh, applications. So I will leave uh, with that final um, screen capture from um, uh, American comedian John Oliver at the whole thing about infrastructure. And I think it, it uh, kind of uh, agrees with something like GenBank, where there's a lot of things happening behind the scenes, lots of people doing things, and if we do our job well, you really shouldn't notice anything. So I want to acknowledge particularly Barbara Robertson, who did a lot of the stuff that I, that I showed you here, uh, Scott Federer, who's doing important work with the bacterial uh, types and the bacterial genomes, and then multiple uh, other people on NCBI staff. Thank you.